afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to this sixth session in the joint series of uh, the Austin School, the Austin Review Development Policy, and the Smith School on the economics of COVID-19. We've covered a number of issues so far in this series, ranging from globalization of trade to regional finance to macro coordination to the effects of the pandemic on sub-Saharan Africa. And then in the most recent session, thankfully chaired by the former director of the Martin School who stepped in for me at short notice uh, on supply chain and demand shock. So thank you, Ian Golden. Very, uh, very grateful you could do that for me. Um, today, we have a real treat for you. Uh, we are looking at baby steps, the gender division of childcare during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we have the experts uh, with us to talk about this question. Professor Sarah Smith is professor in the School of Economics at Bristol. Uh, she has an Oxford heritage, having done PPE and specialised in politics, actually, uh, and spent some time in a political consultancy before, like many of us, seeing the light and moving to economics. Uh, she then did a master's at the LSC, PhD at UCL, and has spent some time at the Institute for Fiscal Studies and was previously the chair of the Royal Economic Society's Women's Committee. And with her, her co-author in their joint paper in the Oxford Review is Professor Almadita Sevilla, who is Professor of Economics and Public Policy at UCL and co-director of the UCL Center of Time Use Research. She's held positions at Queen Mary, at Oxford, and the Congressional Budget Office in Washington uh, after a PhD in Brown uh, in, in Family and Population Economics and Econometrics. And she is currently the chair of the Royal Economic Society's Women's Committee. So we really have the full force uh, with us today, which is wonderful. And um, Almudina and Sarah are going to tell you about uh, a wonderful natural experiment. Now, economists love natural experiments, or in, in a sense, because uh, you know the COVID nineteen is giving us these research opportunities that we wouldn't have otherwise had. So that's the good bit. The bad bit is that um, it's also uh, de depriving many women of opportunities that they would have otherwise had. So that's the finding of the paper, which we'll get to in a moment. What they what they've done is cleverly used the the impact of the pandemic to. Uh, have a deeper understanding of the division of home labour using data on, on the daily lives of, of people across the UK with families under 12. And, and I'm one of those families with three children under 12. And perhaps somewhat ironically, it's my wife who's looking after them now while I'm here talking mm -hmm. to you. Uh, but that's it for my uh, introductory remarks while I'm already on the back foot. And I'll hand over to, to Sarah to present the findings of the paper. So thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much, Cameron. Um, so yeah, so in the uh, in, in the traditional style of an academic seminar, I'm afraid I'm going to revert to some slides if I can get them to load. So let's see how I get on with sharing my screen. Uh, just to prompt, I thought I'd just walk through the main results first, if that's okay, and then um, open it up for questions. That's perfect, thank you. That's working. Excellent. Right. So, um, so what were we looking at? Um, so, what the COVID pandemic represented was a major shock both to the demand side and the supply side for home childcare. So, there was a massive increase in demand with the closure of schools and nurseries and other forms of childcare. Uh, but there was also an increase in supply, as you know, many uh, people uh, were put onto furlough and some lost their jobs. So. Uh, what we were interested in was seeing what the combined impact of both of these events were. We thought this was a really interesting opportunity to see whether traditional patterns of division of childcare carried over or whether there might be a disruption and we might see new patterns emerging. Um, so we were interested in finding out what was happening in the immediate aftermath of the COVID pandemic and the lockdown. So we commissioned uh, survey data from Ipsos Mori as part of their omnibus survey. Uh, the analysis we're going to present focuses mainly on heterosexual couples with young children. Uh, we define young children as being less than or equal to 12. So what did we find? Um, so, you know, obviously, Many uh, people during lockdown were kind of kept inside their homes and within homes of uh, families with young children, essentially there was a huge uh, transformation in what they were having to do. And we were finding, you know, not surprisingly, that 
families with young children were basically doing the equivalent of an additional working week in terms of childcare. I mean, the sheer volume of childcare, uh, the additional childcare that um, families with young children face was really quite staggering. Um, and, you know, remember many of these families were still working, working from home, you know, and in some cases of also trying to juggle kind of working at their normal places of work. What we found was that traditional divisions of childcare were largely kind of carried over onto this additional burden of childcare. So what we found was that women have done by far the greatest share of this additional childcare. So they did on average around 63%. So that's not to say that men weren't stepping up um, and doing uh, some childcare. In fact, you know, they increased the amount of childcare that they did. But what we found, and I'll show you in a minute, the patterns, men's childcare time is much more sensitive to their employment than it is for women. So in a sense, what you had was this big increase in demand for childcare, which we remember meeting, the supply side disruptions were affecting the men, but the demand side burden was mainly forming, falling on the women. Also, so we didn't look at this, but you know, there've been a number of studies um, sort of focusing on what's been happening to childcare. So we know from other studies that Men often specialize in certain types of childcare activities, focusing a bit more education and structured play rather than general care. Um, and also in terms of housework, they tend to do grocery shopping rather than sort of general cleaning. Um, so yeah, so, so men were doing more, but it was kind of a little bit specialized and it was really very much linked to whether they were working or not, whereas women were doing more kind of like irris irrespective of whether they're working. So I think you can say, you know, we've heard a lot um, sort of in the aftermath of COVID and increased working from home that we're going to see transformations in the way people work. I think, you know, the, the takeaway from looking at what was happening in the immediate aftermath in terms of COVID is it was an old way of dividing childcare. There was nothing new about essentially the division of um, childcare during the COVID pandemic. Um, there's also evidence that women have taken a worse economic hit than men during uh, the kind of uh, recession and the, 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 the economic um, disruption caused by COVID and the subsequent lockdown. Um, this is very different to what ha has happened in past recessions, um, where it, in past recessions it's often been men who've taken a worse economic hit, but actually the, in, this, um, in this case it's women. We found that women were five percentage points more likely than men not to be working. So either on furlough or actually having left employment altogether. Among women with young children, there's a greater gap, a 10 percentage point gap between women with young children and men with young children. Those are the findings from our study, but they mirror almost exactly the findings from other studies that have estimated the same um, uh, gender differences. So women work in sectors that were harder hit, so retail and um, leisure. So we know those are the sectors, and hospitality, those are the sectors which were most affected by lockdown. But this isn't the full story in terms of understanding why women were more likely not to be working. In fact, I think women were not working partly because of the childcare that they had to do. So the, one of the nice things about our study was we able to track women from you know, what they were doing before COVID to what they were doing after COVID. And those women who pre-COVID did a higher share of childcare were more likely to be not working. So in a sense, you know, they, they, there was some endogeneity or some choice in terms of whether they were working or not. Other studies have also found, we, we just looked at employment as a sort of binary outcome. Other studies have found that women have reduced their hours to accommodate childcare. So that's also going to add to the economic hit that they've faced. So as I said, um, women have been juggling work and childcare much more than men. So these figures show the kind of number of additional hours done by men and women, depending on sort of in the left-hand side, sort of your own employment status, and then the right-hand side, your partner's employment status. So what you can see is, so first of all, you know, the amount of additional childcare being done by women is greater than the amount of additional childcare being done by men. And second, the, you know, there's less variation in those bars for women than there is for men. So, you know, this idea that, you know, yes, men are increasing, but it's mainly when they're not working. So when they've had this sort of, you know, uh, economic shock, whereas for women, they're typically doing large amounts of additional childcare, even when they're working, hence the kind of reduction in um, hours. Um, and also, you know, an increase in, in the amount of juggling that they do. 
So I know that the IFS study, actually, Amadine has also been involved in that, and she can tell you more about uh, sort of the uh, parallel IFS study. But they looked at time use data, where you can look at sort of different activities done within discrete windows during the day. And their finding was that for every uh, one hour of uninterrupted work time women were enjoying, so enjoy, I use enjoying advisedly, but for every one hour un uninterrupted work time women had, men had three hours. So this idea, I think, you know, we, coming from the data is that women are really juggling a lot more and having to combine work and childcare sort of, you know, hour by hour to a greater extent than men, men um, were. So why does this matter? Um, well, I think there are sort of two um, sort of issues of concern. So first of all is, you know, all this juggling, all this extra childcare is like a huge strain for parents. You know, I think, you know, you can imagine, you know, facing an additional work equivalent of a working week in terms of hours childcare, there's little uh, downtime for parents of young children. So again, in the IFS study, pre-lockdown, 70% of parents were reporting some leisure time at seven o'clock compared with only 40% during lockdown. So there's really no break. And obviously, you know, you're all, you know, in, in, in the real lockdown phase, um, everyone was, you know, not allowed out either. So, you know, a huge, a huge strain on people. Um, and we know that women's mental health has deteriorated twice as much as men's has, you know, during um, during the pandemic and since since the lockdown period. So I think, you know, that in itself it suggests that this additional childcare and the way it was divided is, um, you know, is, is, is a matter of concern. And then the other issue, of course, slightly longer term is the possible implications for the gender pay gap. So women are currently paid around 20 percent less than men. And we know from other research that childcare is, you know, probably the most significant single factor in terms of driving the gender pay gap. So the gender pay gap really kind of becomes more pronounced after the arrival of children because women are sort of, um, you know, factoring children into their employment choices. So we know gender pay gap reporting, which the government introduced um, last year, uh, two years ago, is currently suspended. So, you know, we don't know the immediate impact of any of these measures. It'll be interesting to see, uh, you know, what happens uh, when gender pay gap reporting is resumed. Um, so you may think it's kind of, you know, this is only temporary. You know, we're hopefully you know, at some point, you know, we may, uh, you know, schools have reopened, nurseries have reopened, you know, all this additional childcare is now not uh, being required to be provided in the home. Um, I think it's, you know, e even if it were only temporary, there are likely to be permanent effects arising. So, you know, looking very close to home in academia, you know, so one very measurable impact of the additional burden of childcare on women compared to men has been uh, a reduction in the share of new working papers, you know, preprint publications coming from women versus men. So some details, you know, it's detailed study of, you know, the, 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 the publications of the new research that's coming out, the share of new work on COVID-19 from women is particularly low, you know, and so if you're not getting the research done, that's going to feature, you know, in, in not getting any papers, which is going to feature in, you know, sort of potentially lower rates of promotion and progression going forward. So even a temporary impact can have a permanent effect. And also, you know, at the moment, we don't really know how temporary it is. Um, you know, already many schools are having to send children home because of self-isolation. And also, you know, there's worrying signs uh, as to what might be happening in the childcare industry. So, you know, many, particularly early years, childcare providers uh, were facing a loss of income during the pandemic because, you know, obviously they had to shut and many women and men being on furlough or working from home or having lost their jobs. There was a reduced demand uh, for outside the home childcare. So they lost their income. There's also an increased cost for early years childcare provider because they have to have increased security measures to make themselves COVID secure. You know, so that there's a, you know, th this, um, this COVID pandemic may have a sort of permanent impact or a sort of longer term effect on, on the volume or the amount of um, early years childcare that's available. And again, you know, that, that is going to mean that some of these, this juggling and this increased childcare is going to, um, you know, persist. Um, so in many ways, COVID has been, you know, exposing a number of fundamental inequalities in our society. 
Um, and I think, you know, I think this evidence is suggesting that, you know, gender inequality is, is one of those inequalities that's really being revealed and tested. So just to finish with this quote, you know, uh, so we're all in the same storm, but we're not in the same boat. And I think men and women have not been in the same boat when it comes to um, looking after kids and juggling work and childcare. And then I Thank you. Thanks very much, Sarah. Look, I'm sure that many of uh, many of us listening in can empathise with those findings. Uh, I'm sure many of the women will uh, mm -hmm. particularly empathise. I know um, when the kids went back to school in this household, uh, my wife came home on day one and said, "I feel like a completely new woman." Uh, it was a big relief too, but I didn't didn't quite have that same response. Now, Al Medina, as co-author of the paper, um, I'm wondering. What did you find the most surprising result here? Or well, maybe none of it was surprising. Maybe this is exactly what you expected. So um, while Almadine is doing that and you're on mute, um, I might just pass to back to Sarah. So but what was surprising? I mean, so uh, yeah, I mean, it, so in retrospect, it's sort of one of those things that kind of ex post wasn't surprising. Um, it was more disappointing, you know. So. You know, we you know we know that um, pre-COVID there was this sort of two-thirds, one-third division when it came to childcare. Um, I think what was sort of, but you know, but the change that came about as a result of COVID was just so huge in a way. You know, you have this massive increase in in childcare, and I think I was you know, the, the part of the reason for wanting to do the research was to see whether this had led to a kind of you know a, a sort of a, a new a new division, a new kind of like, you know, way of distributing childcare within the household. So, you know, in a way, perhaps it shouldn't be surprising, but to see the, you know, the mapping from the pre-COVID allocation to the post-COVID allocation being kind of like so similar, I think in a way the similarity of it was surprising because it wasn't a marginal change, you know, as economists were interested in, you know, like what happens at the margin, but an extra 40 hours a week of childcare you know, compared to a baseline of sort of 15 to 20 is not a marginal change by any imagination. So, you know, I, I think I think that was surprising just how just just how sort of persistent that division was. I think that was sort of to me quite striking. Um, and I was really hoping for a disruption and a sort of a new way of, you know, allocating childcare. And it, it just didn't really seem to come out in the data. Mm, there are lots of parallels there. Uh, I, I could go on and on about the green recovery too and the, and the power of inertia and incumbency and the system just continuing as it is unless you, you properly intervene otherwise. Um, now, speaking of uh, these challenges, things continuing as they are, let me take a slightly more negative view. Almudena, I'm hoping I can come to you now. The World Economic Forum has said that COVID-19 has been the greatest setback for gender equality in a decade. So it's not just a continuation of existing inequalities, it's made matters worse. Is that an exaggeration, do you think, or, or are they right? I don't think it is an exaggeration. I think as, as, as Sarah has mentioned, uh, many of us uh, were hoping for a shock to the system that would change, tilt the balance of the gender division of labor at home. Um, instead, we've continued and, and there is a real danger that um, in the longer run, it actually gets gets worse. As women stay at home, they lose out on their uh, labor market opportunities, and that creates a vicious cycle where they they devote more time uh, to household responsibilities, less time to work. Um, so, so I think it's it's um, it's quite right, and and we should be um, looking at the space and, and making sure that we don't go backwards at least. If, if that is right, it's obviously very serious. And the question then is you then start to think about what can the government do, what could be done from a policy perspective, uh, what should have been done perhaps, or at least given where we are now, what, what, what measures, what mechanisms, what solutions are there? Because getting just kind of sending out a broadcast from, uh, dare I say, Boris Johnson to the men of the world to step up may, may not kind of do the good, deliver the goods. What, what should the government be doing here? Um, so I was, ha I was having a look at the, so the UN has a sort of um, a gender policy tracker. So they've really highlighted the negative impact of COVID on women and actually not just in terms of childcare, but, you know, the economic shocks and also 
you know, the, the, the increase in uh, gender based violence that we've seen as well. So there are sort of, you know, I think in terms of setbacks for women, I think it goes bigger than just, uh, you know, the sort of uh, family division of childcare. But, you know, there, there ha so some countries have taken positive steps. Um, so thinking about additional family leave, um, you know, so, it, the, you know, in the current situation, you know, if children have to self-isolate from school, you know, women will have to use up holiday, you know, they'll, I mean, it sort of seems, you know, they're quite hard hit by, you know, their family responsibilities, they have to use up holiday, they, they're going to lose an income, and some countries are recognizing it by giving uh, families additional leave and giving, you know, the people who look after the people who are self-isolating cash payments, not just giving, you know, the people who are self-isolating cash payments, you know, so if you're, if you're looking after a child who doesn't necessarily have COVID, but they've been sent home by their school, you know, in a sense, it seems like you, sh you should probably be eligible for some benefits as well, particularly if you have um, low, low income. And then, you know, more generally, I think recognizing the infrastructure nature of childcare, it's, you know, fundamentally important for, you know, sort of trying to get women back into work um, and ensure, you know, a sort of greater equality uh, of opportunity. And I think, you know, the reason why this might have these permanent effects is, is if that childcare infrastructure is sort of eroded, you know, then you get these, you know, the sort of, you have the short term shock and then it's allowed to persist over time. So, you know, really looking very, carefully, uh, you know, the sustainability of early years provision and making sure that, you know, that there, there's payments in place to keep those, that, that childcare going, I think is, is, is really, really important. Um, it does seem, however, that it can't just be the government because, you know, obviously it requires employers to, um, you know, sort of not penalize women who have taken time out. You know, we know women who go part-time, for example, because of caring responsibilities often slip behind in the in in in, in the workplace you know so the, the gender gap really opens up after women have children and there's a sort of part-time penalty which isn't necessarily immediate but really you know sort of builds up over time so you know perhaps it is messaging from Boris Johnson I'm not sure but it is you know it requires employers to uh you know sort of not not penalize women for you know the fact that they're bearing the brunt of this increased child care and 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 the sort of possibly longer term effects of it um how you do that i don't know but uh you know sort of i think trying to value you know gender equality within the workplace as as a way of ensuring you know that you get the best you know the best talent is made the most of and also you know ensuring that it's a it's a better workplace if it's looking after both its men and its women yeah, it makes great sense. Um, now, but, you know, I'd like to ask you the same or pretty much the same question. Sarah may have stolen all of the good answers, but actually it's a question also from Lucy Herford, who, who asks, what is the best solution, government or otherwise, to, to address this setback for gender equality? Do you have any magic tricks up your sleeves or perhaps not magic tricks? Actually, this is probably going to be hard and sustained work. And what, what do we need to be doing? Well, I, th I think if we think about, um, so what Sarah was mentioning at the start, uh, families need protection uh, to, to, um, to be able to face this, this shock and the shock continues and it's here to continue as we don't know when schools may close or not. Um, and, um, it, but I think there is a double-edged sword uh, when, when we offer uh, you know, all these kind of benefits. And I'm not arguing that we don't, but we should be careful because it's always the woman that will stay at home. Um, so, so I think, you know, in the same way that uh, some governments now uh, have incentives for fathers to stay at home when there is a newborn child, we need some sort of asymmetric incentives so that it's not always the woman that takes on, uh, you know, the, the extra... Um, the extra days to look after the kids or that remains at home uh, working from home while her partner goes off and works in the office because we know that that has um, you know working from home and being interrupted has consequences for for your earnings and your productivity um, in the same way that the loss of experience because you are on maternity leave has so so I think just being creative and challenging, and you know, when thinking about these policies, we need to be 
thinking about policies that challenge the traditional uh, gender division of labor and, and maybe incentivize, incentivizing men uh, rather than, you know, the, the women. Yeah, I think it certainly seems to me to be a great point uh, to be incentivizing men to to step up, uh, as Sarah put it earlier. Now, um, there's a lovely question here from Eloise Ardley uh, about um, the fact that you know this study is um, effectively focusing on heterosexual couples. Uh, but could we learn? Do we have any data? Could we learn anything about same-sex parents uh, or single-parent households? And if we were to use um, those different households, same sex or single parent households, uh, alongside the heterosexual uh, households, might we learn something about whether it is, you know, how much of this is gender per se, and how much of it is about the uh, evolution in the pre existing distribution of childcare between uh, parents of, of, of any gender? I I have some um, interesting findings from the US, actually. I'm working on um, what's happened uh, in the states that have closed the schools as a result of, of uh, the pandemic and how that it has, in, it has impacted men and women differently. And the interesting thing coming out from there is that single women um, haven't been that much affected in terms of hours of work. And I think that goes back to, um, this is still very preliminary with with looking at um you know immediate effects obviously in the long run it's, it may be a different question but at least in the short run it seems that these women have a good network of support um and that goes back to sarah's point um about uh the childcare provision uh either by the government or by the private sector uh, in in the case of single some of the single women in the us it is neighbors and it is voluntary help uh, but that just highlights how important it is to have that sort of uh support uh for for childcare that is much more flexible than what uh we currently have or is provided by okay. Can, can I ask a question about that? Because that's really interesting. So but is that because they, in effect, they need the income? So I mean, are they, are they not reducing their, their hours because of the, the requirement for their income? Yes. I mean, obviously, yeah. I, I think there is a big, a big, but, you know, but that, but then how do they manage, right? Yeah. Uh, that's exactly. the reason. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, we're just beginning to analyze uh, these data, but, but this seems to be um sort of the story um yeah and it, and it is in line with what happens when a school close for holidays that these single single women or uh ethnic minorities in the u.s seem to be better protected because of this social network that they have right. uh, but of course um, we cannot count on voluntary provision of, of child care or family and friends uh, right. it just highlights how important it is so yeah. and I, I think the, uh, you know, looking at same sex couples would be absolutely fascinating. Obviously, unfortunately, in our data, we just wouldn't have had enough to be able to mm. uh, you know, sort of say anything meaningful. But I think it would be a really interesting sort of, uh, you know, con con contrasting group to look at. Um, but it has to be one for the future. Would you would you so let me push you a little bit and say, would you have a hypothesis as to how much of it is to do with gender and how much of it is to do with kind of role performance, let me put it that way, uh, kind of irrespective of gender? Um, I mean, it's a little bit hard to dis I mean, it's a little bit hard to disentangle, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, it, it, I mean, clear, I mean, clearly, there are some very strong social norms at play here. I mean, you know, we, I mean, we, you know, so you, you, you might think that there's, you know, some kind of like specialization and it's, you know, it's kind of an efficient sort of um, allocation. But, you know, the fact that women kind of carried on, you know, providing a similar number of hours, irrespective of what was happening to yeah. their employment, what was happening to their partner's employment. This is sort of telling us that these sort of social norms are just hugely important in terms of driving behavior. And whether it's, you know, because women are the primary carers or because they're women, you know, it's very, becomes quite hard to disentangle the two, I guess. I mean, well, I mean, 
<laughs> I've worked a little bit on that, <laughs> trying yeah. to disentangle the two. And one way of doing it is, is to see uh, what happens across countries. Um, and, um, and we know that depending on gender roles in each country, you have different divisions of household labor. Mm -hmm. So women are the same across all the countries, but women and men, or there isn't any significant biological differences between men and women across countries, but there does seem to be a difference in terms of what those women and, and men think. And that that is reflected in economic outcomes and the division of household labor. So we do right. we do know that um, gender roles are important. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, both of those points really quite powerful, actually. Uh, uh, Amadine, your point about the cross country cross country kind of variations very useful to tease out those answers. That makes sense to me to completely. And Sarah, your point that actually. Even even just within your own data set, the the fact that you see variability uh, by gender, even if the man was the primary caregiver, uh, or, or other, yeah, I just, actually you you've you've really I feel like you've given a good answer to that that question, even without having same sex data. So it'd be great to have it too. But okay, um, now let me go back to the list of questions. There's um, there's one here from John Rosenfield who says. Uh, I'm going to read it out for you. Do you think that a study that assigns to men the cooking, cleaning, shopping, and laundry could be fruitful? I'll let you interpret that how, however you see fit. But I, I guess the question is, um, have there ever been any kind of, I guess, quite interventionist sociological studies that would flip these gender roles around and, and uh, for any length of time and, and see what happens? I suspect the answer is no. Uh, uh, and then the question is, what would we learn if we did that? And um, maybe the answer is not very much, John. I don't know, but let me let me ask the experts. What do you think? Do you want to answer that one? Is it, no, it's, it, sounds, it, it sounds like the premise for an interesting reality TV show. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think that's probably nail on the head. That's probably what it is. It may not give you interesting econometrics. I mean, I mean, I, I, well, I mean, I think Almadina knows this literature better than I do. So, I mean, I think there have been, you know, I, I mean, I think the interesting group are, in a sense, you know, the men who you know, they, you know, so, so their behavior is a little bit shaped by, you know, the economic shock. So there's a bunch of men who uh, were on furlough and who or who lost their jobs. And they were sort of perhaps married to, or partnered with women who were working. And those are the men that we see, you know, increasing childcare. So this, you know, this is um, the real life equivalent of sort of forcing them to do, you know, the ironing and the, uh, the childcare. Mm. So the question is, you know, sort of in six months or in a year's time, are those men still, you know, doing more than they otherwise would have done? So I think, I think, I think we have had that experiment. I think, you know, we, as I said, you know, we, we don't want to, what we're not claiming is that men have done nothing. You know, men have increased their childcare. It's just not as much. Um, but there have been a group of men who where they've, you know, they've had the kind of the, the sort of the, 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 the economic shock that has meant that they have more time on their hands and they're the ones who've increased the most. So those are the interesting set to kind of follow over time. Mm. And my understanding, Amadina, is that there are some studies, sh you know, the, 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 the evidence on the persistence of these sort of, you know, shocks to social norm driven behavior is a little bit mixed. Is that right? Yeah, so from the paternity leave experiments, we know that um, you know men do a little bit more of the childcare, not necessarily a bit more of the housework, but over the longer term, uh, it is not clear that you know men spending 15 more days, which is the usual paternity leave, has any long run uh, consequence for the gender division of labor. Um, but but here we have a much bigger shock, so so there may be there may be room for improvement. There are very interesting questions. I'm sure we'll see the follow up study from one or both of you or somebody else in in a, in a year's time. Um, I just wanted to so uh, tell the audience. Uh, obviously, the questions are coming in, which is which is great. You can click on the ask a question button at the bottom right of your screen, and you can also, if you're interested, click on the kind of turquoisey. Uh, button in the middle bottom of your screen to go directly to read the paper. 
Um, now, I'm going to reveal what surprised me most about your paper when I first looked at it. And it shouldn't have. It just kind of reveals my ignorance, I guess. But um, a full working hours week of extra childcare. I thought, really? Even with even with my three cherubs behind me, is is that what we were doing? But then you just add up the numbers. And they're at school 9 or 8.30 till 3.30 or 4, five days a week. And it is indeed uh, exactly those hours of the uh, – it's a working hours week that's been added to every – uh, every household in childcare, and then the question is, well, where, where, where in God's name does it come from? Because some of us are pretty busy to begin with, and uh, I know many of my colleagues. Um, it's been coming out of sleep, uh, and I don't know if you have any insight on that. Clearly, some of it's been coming out of leisure. So, so those households who had a bit of leisure time uh, before the pandemic lost their leisure. Uh, and those households who didn't have much leisure because they're working too hard, is it, is it literally coming out of sleep? Do we know that or can we speculate? Um, so I guess, I guess, I mean, we're, so we should probably caveat the, you know, the, the quantity because, you know, so we have self-reported data. And so Amadina want, might want to talk more about this because, you know, so she's been looking at time use data, which is sort of, I guess, more sort of tracking activities sort of hour to hour. So, you know, so when, when family self-report, 40 hours. So they may be doing, you know, things at the same time. So, you know, they may be sort of typing and looking after their children being on a call. So it's sort of not necessarily 40 uninterrupted hours of childcare. And I think there has, you know, we, we all know from interrupted Zoom calls that it's sort of, you know, quite often you're trying to do multiple things um, at once. Um, so Amadina can comment a little bit on those sort of, you know, the, the different measures. Um, you know, but women have also reduced their employment so you know quite i mean there well there were people on furlough and people who lost their jobs and then you know the ifs evidence suggests they also reduced reduced their employment as well so mm -hmm. less leisure possibly a bit less sleep and a bit less working but i'll i'll hand over to the expert on <laughs> time use, on time use and, and 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 what what hours of childcare means yeah i mean I I remember when I started working with, so, so we collect time diaries, which is basically 24 hour accounts of what people do every 10 minutes. So people, respondents uh, fill out these diaries where they say what they're doing uh, every 10 minutes. And, and we've known for, for a long time that um, men and women spend different times in, in unpaid work. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, and it's about uh, the ratios are pretty similar to what we find in our paper. Uh, women spend about three hours on doing childcare, so this is reported as as childcare. Um, men about one, but of course the time with children is much greater. And uh, and I think what we observe here uh, through this uh, study is is basically time with children being interrupted uh, or or uh, just you know, monitoring children and looking after children actively or not. And, and, um, and, and that is important because it has implications for labor market outcomes. So, so the time, I guess the, the measure, whether it is, is what it, what is an uninterrupted time, where it, it is time, what the nature of that time, it is important. It is important to quantify uh, but regardless, what the message here is that uh, it has negative consequences for, for women's earnings potentials, not just in the short run, but also in the long run. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Now, there are a few more good questions here I, I want to come to, but I just want to share a, uh, I'm not even sure this is a question from me, it's a speculation that you may wish to comment on. Um, I, a few years ago, I read this piece about the maker versus the manager time schedule. I don't know if you know this one. The idea being that if you're managing things, you can do things in kind of 10 and 15 minute intervals or half hour intervals. You, you, know, you, you have a meeting, you make a decision, you send people on their way. Whereas if you're making something, you may need multiple hours of uninterrupted focused time to do your analysis or to create your painting or to write your um, you know, symphony. Uh, and I guess I'm, as I say, it's probably not very help helpful speculation, but I wonder if the makers who need those big chunks of uninterrupted time have had a much harder go 
whether women or men, actually, uh, but probably particularly women through this pandemic compared to the managers. So if you're if you're in a if you're a woman in a managing role, then of course it's it's going to hit your productivity when or when when the children come in and uh, when you forget to lock the door behind you before you go online. Um, but but perhaps that's less damaging than if you're trying to complete a piece of artwork. So as I say, it's speculation. It's not coming out of your your data or your research. But do you have any thoughts about that? Does it sound reasonable? Well, it would. I mean, I don't know about the makers versus managers, but it certainly chimes with that. Um, you know, really quite striking drop in female productivity in terms of research. I mean, you know, I think. I mean, research is a making type activity that you really need. You know, clear and uninterrupted <laughs> headspace to think about. Uh, you know, the issues and to get into it and. You know, I think that's that's really shown up. I mean, because I mean, also, you know, we so we may speculate that you know about the, the type of research, but I think you know, COVID nineteen and a lot of the issues it's raising are really the sorts of issues you'd expect women academics to engage with. So the fact that we've seen, um, you know, fewer women, uh, you know, uh, co-authoring papers about COVID nineteen, I think that's really striking. So apparently, and it wasn't. So I think again, this is going to your point. So. You know, so so there are different stages in producing academic research. Some of those are more managing tasks when you're sort of, you know, maybe, uh, you know, cleaning up a, a paper and resubmitting it versus, you know, starting from scratch with a research project. And it's the starting from scratch, the really the making of the research, I think, where the evidence is showing that that women have have suffered as opposed to kind of resubmitting papers or tidying them up. So so that would be some, you know, evidence from very close to home that would kind of fit with that that kind of pattern. Very interesting. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. That's so. One way of looking at uh, your question is to within the makers, who are the ones that have had more interruptions to their time, to their working time, and what have been the impacts on their productivity? And I think the research provides. Uh, you know, if we if we consider research as being a making activity, those with uh, a higher childcare burden and in interruptions to their productive time have been women in academia and, and those are the ones that have been suffering the most. Um, so yeah. uh, I've, I've got a, a long line of further thoughts on that topic, but unfortunately I'd be doing an injustice to those who are submitting <laughs> questions given we've got so little time left. So um, uh, let me go back because Eloise asked a really lovely question about the control of single sex versus um, uh, same sex versus heterosexual couples. Um, she's can come in with a follow-up. Could you control the data where house and, and look at situations where some fathers have taken shared parental leave uh, since the new policy came in and how that might affect roles? So I guess this goes to the point of, you know, is there hysteresis in, in behaviours once you've changed a few nappies, you kind of get with the programme, it's not actually so, so terrible after all. Uh, uh, and, and the men who do stay home when their children are born might be more likely to step up now or, um, you know, in due course, you, as, as we were discussing earlier, you might be able to look at studies that might show um, long run changes in contributions to childcare from the men who stepped up during this pandemic. Yeah. Um, so my understanding is that take up of shared parental leave has been incredibly low. It's sort of been sort of 2% of those who are eligible, which sort of goes back to Almadina's point about, you know, really try having to kind of get gender uh, sort of changes in gender norms, not just by offering policies, but in a way by incentivizing people to take up those policies. I think with the shared parental leave, one of the problems is if, if a woman is the sort of secondary earner, then the cost of the man taking the shared parental leave is higher. So it sort of, it never really happens. Um, so I don't think, so again, I don't think there would be enough men who are sort of, you know, stepped up because of shared parental leave to really make a sort of strong sample for analysis. But actually, you know, I, I think explore, in a way, in a sense, what we want to explore is not those households which follow the traditional model, but the households which follow the alternative model and sort of see what happens there. Um, but we didn't we didn't focus on, you know, sort of particular household types in our study, although, you know, it would have been interesting to look at. Um, and as I said, the, you know, the follow up study of what happened to those men who were furloughed because that's a you know, that was a sizable group of people, you know, sort of twenty percent being furloughed, and and what happened to them longer term. I think that's a really interesting 
um, group to follow follow up over time. Yeah. So we've got questions, uh, various clusters of them. I mean, there's, there's one about how much of how much of this is natural and unavoidable, where women physically need to have time off to have children, and um, yeah, I think uh, without wanting to go into um, I'm, Lucy, that's your question. Thank you for it. Um, I might uh, avoid getting into deep nature versus nurture and or uh, discussions about whether we have to put up with gender inequality and, and say that we're actually just going to do what we can to address it anyway. Um, but but unless, uh, and Sarah and Almudina, if you wanted to come in on that, let me allow you to, but otherwise, um, let me pause. I think the cross-country comparison offers a great um, opportunity to study this nature versus nature i mean when, when you look okay another kind of studies is looking at second generation immigrants they all um uh, face the same sort of institutions because they are all in the same country say so second generation immigrants in the us but they come from very different backgrounds and and their behavior in terms of gender uh what they do at home and also female labor source participation etc is totally different mm. so really um it is it is about gender gender roles and if it is about biology i mean technology can easily solve you know right now i'm sure well, you know it would be easier to solve in, in some <laughs> to some extent so so absolutely. i think it is the right. gender roles. great so thanks for the question lucy but we'll we'll, we'll dispatch that away <laughs> fairly swiftly um move, moving on so on on the kind of where the time come from question there's there's a follow-up from cl um what about time spent on social interactions with friends did did women get a raw end of the deal there i mean implicitly i guess the answer is yes you can't spend that much more time looking after the children and maintain the richness and diversity of your social networks um and cl goes on to say did men keep their sacred boys' nights out. I have to say this man didn't. Oh, well, <laughs> so, so we, did, we, didn't, we didn't have uh, that level of detail, but actually, so I referred to the study of um, uh, male and female mental health. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, the conclusion from that study was that the increased family responsibility was partly to blame for the deterioration, the greater deterioration in women's mental health, but actually, um, the, so women who experienced the greater deterioration in mental health were those who pre-COVID had the biggest social networks. So it's sort of, so I, you know, so my interpretation of that is in a sense, neither women nor men got to have their girls or their men's night out, but it was worse for women because they typically had bigger social networks and derived sort of more mental health, sort of better mental health from those social networks. Yeah. But what we know from, again, time in studies in, in the arrival of children, which is a similar, a similar shock to what we've experienced with COVID in terms of childcare demands on households. Um, we know that, um, that women give up leisure and they give up on personal care activities and leisure socializing and in in is part of leisure and, and going out with friends uh going to the gym as well it's a social activity um and and, and women give that up in order to increase childcare. um so and and we also see that historically uh when you know female labor force participation has increased uh, quite substantially since the 70s childcare time hasn't decreased so women are not spending less time with their children what are they doing then with with the, you know with how can they manage and and it is leisure time and um personal care uh, to some extent so so both historically and in cross sections, we we observe the same thing. Something's got to give. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so now many parents, uh, certainly in my situation of having three children who are um, who go out to to educational provision elsewhere, have a deep appreciation of the value that teachers provide uh, post this pandemic. Hopefully we all had an appreciation of the value of teachers before it as well. 
Uh, and there's a question here from Sandy Ruxton about an appreciation for the value of care. And there's much greater visibility of caring for not just children, but actually caring for the ill and the sick and, uh, and the isolated across the economy. So it's a much broader zoomed out kind of question. Do you think that this renewed appreciation for carers, you know, perhaps for the NHS more generally and for teachers, um, but in particular caring, could this give a kind of Philip a bit of a push to the caring economy? Uh, along the lines, Sandy suggests, of the Women's Budget Group report. Um, yeah, well, I am a member of the Women's Budget Group. <laughs> so I was going to say, you know, one of the things that that we push for is is for the government to take this, this kind of carer's lens and, and gender lens into their budget. Um, so, so, you know, if we're talking about policy, that, that would be one way forward. I think there is a, a fundamental distinction between what teachers and, and healthcare workers do and what parents do. Uh, and this is, I think, the difficulty that, um, or, or well, this is, this is why our study is so important to put uh, the evidence out there uh, and to, uh, so that, well, so why is it different for parents and say for teachers? Teachers uh, choose to be teachers, but, you know they basically parents parents choose to be parents but if you have say um a, a sick uh you know a sick uh, uh family member you don't choose that right so so you know so the argument would be why um or, or teachers didn't choose you know when they, when they were uh, choosing to to teach or to become teachers they didn't they didn't choose to have a situation where they would have to deal with this sort of crisis whereas when you become a parent you know you become a parent for all your life and no matter what right so so then um so so i think that is why it is so difficult to get this message across uh, in some circles uh, that women are really struggling because uh, the underlying sort of assumption is, well, you knew what you were buying into. And, and I think that is why these papers are so important, not just Sarah in, in, in my paper, but, but other papers that are coming out to say, you know, nobody over, oversaw this and, and really it is a lot of work and it's mm -hmm. having uh, a negative impact on women yeah. and, and it's just it's, it's not fair and it's not efficient uh, to run an economy where 50 percent of the population um, cannot fulfill their dreams so uh, but I think we making that an analog or analogy to to other carers is always tricky because of the nature of parenting but maybe Sarah has a different view uh, no, I was just I was just reflecting. Actually, I'm a bit less optimistic than. Um, sorry, I've forgotten. Is it, is it Lucy? Who, who asked the question? Lucy? Lucy? It was Sandy. Yeah, Sandy. Sorry, Sandy. Yeah, I mean, we clap for the carers, but they were just basically the NHS carers. Uh, we're not going to pay them anymore. Um, and I rather fear that you know when the probably inevitable budget cuts come in, I think carers are probably going to be quite hard hit. So, um, you know. I, I, I think you know. I, it I think we a, a timely reminder of all the caring that was done would be good. But you know, I, I I don't see much evidence that we really, as a society, are you know valuing carers much more in a in a in a truly systematic way. Unfortunately. So well, let's pick up on this um, kind of social values. And so it's not just the economic incentives and the government policy, but I mean, you're delivering a better. Oh, gee, I'm running out of time too. So better be quick. So this is Cyrus <laughs> Upal's question. Um, really, because a lot, a lot of this is about societal expectations um, and effectively cultural change. Yeah. Uh, how do we, what, what can we do to move this along quicker? You know, the various stats suggesting at the rate of change, you know, it'll be several millennia before we hit something resembling, I, I exaggerate, but gender equality. What, what might we do to, to help accelerate progress here? 
Um, you know, so I mean, you know, I, I think measures such as the public, you know, it, it's it's a real shame actually that in you know at a, at a point in which gender inequality is facing a setback, the government suspended publication of the gender pay gap, you know, data because in a way I think that was really useful as a way of uh, both highlighting uh, the issue and also giving individuals, uh, you know, something to sort of um, work with. Um, yes, yeah, so, you know, so you know, I I think. You know, you know, it, it, it's it, you know, achieving major, you know, uh, social and cultural change is probably beyond uh, the, uh, you know, the, the capacity of any individual economist. But you know, in general, you know, highlighting the problem, I think, is a really important start. So you know, I really do hope that the government continues with the gender pay gap reporting, and that companies, you know, see that, you know, what what we really want is for companies to see reducing their gender pay gap as a sign of you know their own individual success i think that would be that would be yeah. a really, really and i think sorry sarah since we're running out of time i just want to yeah. say that that takes for the government to adopt gender policy or, or just policies that um that challenge that gender division of, of labor it, it is not enough to compensate women ex post for the extra care uh, we really need to to change that um, gender division of labor by again uh, making sure that men also take the leave and that um, they work from home, etc. Well, they're both great answers to what was surely the toughest question, which I said <laughs> to the end. Uh, my apologies to those of you who asked questions that I didn't get around to answering. Um, I could have kept going for another at least half an hour, maybe maybe much longer. It's a fascinating area. Thank you very much for your work, not just for this paper, for the Oxford Review of Economic Policy, but in this field, full stop. It's really very important. I'm sure those tuning in and listening will have enjoyed the conversation as much as I have. Um, so for those of you tuning in, we have one more, uh, in fact, two more in this series. The session with Mariana Mazzucato uh, next week has been postponed. We'll be back in touch. Keep your eye on the website for the change in date. But we have uh, confirmed, ready to go, is Dr. Yulia Gisa uh, from the Bank of England, who's been managing her two children while sorting out uh, the monetary and, well, the banks uh, thinking on the COVID pandemic. So she will be joining us for a tale of two crises, COVID-19 and the financial system uh, on the 14th of October. So it remains for me to thank Almudina and Sarah for your work, uh, for your insights, for everything you're doing here and for joining me today with the Oxford Martin School. Thank you both. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.